Welcome everyone and thank you for joining me today on the topic of Medicaid. No Medicaid spend down, keep your assets. Hi, my name is Lynn St. Louis and I am an estate planning and elder law attorney at ELG Estate Planning. Uh, we practice elder law and in particular, Medicaid asset preservation strategies. We are coming to you from the state of Washington. What that means is if you are listening from a different state, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about does not apply to you. Medicaid is the program that pays for long-term care. Medicaid is a federal and a state program. Each state has its own set of rules that vary widely. So if you are in a different state, what I'm talking about today likely is not going to be correct for you. So please see an elder law attorney in your state. One of the best ways to find an elder law attorney is to go to the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys website. That's N-A-E-L-A dot org and find an elder law attorney in your state, one that understands and is an expert in Medicaid eligibility, Medicaid benefits and qualification. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Medicaid is the primary government benefits program that pays for long-term care. Medicaid has all sorts of other benefits that you probably have heard of. Medicaid pays for health insurance, um, health coverage, I mean, not insurance. So there are a lot of programs under the Medicaid program. What we're focusing on today is Medicaid long-term care benefits in the state of Washington. There is a lot of misunderstanding about long-term care benefits. One of the first things that a lot of people get wrong, and especially once they start receiving Medicare, is they think that Medicare will pay for their long-term care. It will not. Part of the reason for that confusion comes from, perhaps you're familiar with, there's this limited benefit that once you've been in the hospital, for three midnights and then you leave and you go to rehab care, Medicare is paying at least a part of it. Then after a hundred days, there will be no more Medicare benefits and then you're privately paying for your care unless you qualify for Medicaid or have another source of payment such as long-term care insurance. So don't think that Medicare is gonna pay for your long-term care, it will not. If you have private insurance to pay for it, fantastic. Um, in the state of Washington, we also have just implemented a program uh, to help pay for uh, the your long-term care under uh, a certain program. We're not talking about that today. It's a very limited benefit. What we all know is that long-term care is expensive. I used to quote figures of, um, you know, 10,000 a month, 12,000 a month for nursing home care. Um, I've seen higher than that, and uh, long-term care is simply getting more and more expensive. And we're talking about skilled nursing care. These are, you know, 12,000, 14,000 per month, very expensive. Uh, skilled nursing care is called institutional care. There are other, uh, other types of care that are not quite um, in that category. Uh, you can get care at home. You can get care at an adult family home, assisted living, um, memory care, all of those uh, locations are where you can receive Medicaid long-term care benefits. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I think one of the biggest misunderstanding, misunderstandings about uh, Medicaid is that it is an impoverishment program for everyone. You can have no assets. That's not quite right. There are a number of assets that you can keep and qualify for Medicaid. However, don't get me wrong, if you are a single person, the Medicaid standard is much different than if you are in a, uh, a married couple or domestic registered partners. Then in the state of Washington, you are allowed to keep significantly more money and there are other tools that are available that allow you to keep your assets without having to spend them down. What we're talking about today is 
how Medicaid applies to you if you need long-term care, if you're a single person, or if you are a couple and you're both alive. We've got a lot of other uh, videos that discuss estate planning documents for a couple in particular that allow them to keep half, if not 100% of all their assets through their will that has a supplemental needs trust. But in order for the estate planning documents to come into play, for the will to come into play, one of that couple must have passed on in order for the will to take effect. So that is a completely different situation than what we're talking about today. I do want you to be aware that with the right estate planning documents, if you are in a couple, then one when one dies, there's ways that you can protect half, if not all of your assets against the survivor's long-term care costs. Really extremely important estate planning options that are available. That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about how do you get Medicaid and keep all your assets while you're both alive. So let's talk about what Medicaid's rules are. What assets are countable? For most people, their house is their biggest asset. Is that a countable resource? No, it is not. You can keep your house. Some people say, well, isn't there you know, limits on how much the house is worth? If you are in a, a couple situation, there are no limits. As long as one of you is living in the house, uh, there are no limits to what your house is worth. If you are a single person, yes, there are limits. In the state of Washington, the equity limit for a single person currently is $1,033,000. That is the federal max standard. So if you live in King County and you are a single person, potentially your house is worth more than a million dollars in equity. If that's the case, you're going to need to see an elder law attorney who is going to help you with strategies to draw down your equity such that your house doesn't count against you. So I do want to mention that one of the reasons that Medicaid is so confusing and complicated is that there are so many exceptions to the rules. I'm going to cover a lot of them. My hope is that I don't confuse you. I want to shed light on this subject and give you more information. One of the things primarily especially if you're a single person, is I don't want you to think that you have to spend down all of your money, that you have to sell your house, that there's no other options for you. I can't give you legal advice in this forum, but what I can do is give you enough information, plant that seed in your head that you know that if you are a single person and you're looking at long-term care, see an elder law attorney that understands Medicaid strategies because through Medicaid asset preservation strategies, we are able to preserve a lot of your estate. Now, the topic today is no Medicaid spend down. Couples, that's more for you because with couples, we have more tools available that allow you to keep all of your money. Obviously, if you have multi-millions of dollars, you are not looking at qualifying for the Medicaid program. But folks with a modest amount of money and modest could be 500,000 in your bank, 500,000 to you know a million dollars in your house or beyond. Those are the folks that we are talking to to say, if you are a couple and if that's your situation, we can preserve all of your assets without you having to spend it down. All right, let's go back to talk about, well, what is um, counted? We just talked about the house. The house doesn't count against you unless you're a single person and you have quite a lot of equity above a million dollars. Even so, there are exceptions to the rule. If, for example, you have a disabled child who lives with you, a blind child, a child under the age of 21, the equity limit doesn't count. So that's an important question that your attorney will ask you 
if your home, for example, is worth two million. So what else doesn't count? For the, what I want you to think about just kind of as a general rule is that you start from the premise, all assets count unless I tell you they don't. So your house doesn't count. What else doesn't count against you for Medicaid eligibility? A vehicle does not count regardless of what the value of that vehicle is. It can be your 100,000 whatever vehicle. It doesn't count against you. Anything that you have in your home, any of your personal effects, everything that you have that's considered personal property does not count. Now, if you have titled other vehicles or a titled, you know, you have your car and you have your RV, that's a titled uh, uh, asset, that's gonna count. So when I say personal property, I'm talking about things that don't have titles to them. What else doesn't count? Oh, and by the way, your personal effects involves your, could involve your artwork, your jewelry, your musical instruments, anything along those lines. So you don't need to get rid of and sell all your stuff. What else doesn't count? A burial plot, burial urn, a space is exempt regardless of the value. Uh, amounts to cover your um, burial expenses don't count. Um, there's a couple of different options with that. You can have a burial fund, but it's only limited to $1,500. Or instead, what we typically will recommend to clients is that they have an irrevocable burial plan of a reasonable value. Well, what's reasonable? Well, it depends upon what your situation is. You know, a $10,000 uh, plan can be very reasonable if it's an irrevocable plan. So there are ways to make sure that you put your money to good use to have things in place because when you pass, then your family won't, won't need to pay for any of that. You've already uh, purchased it in advance and Medicaid allows you to do so without counting that asset as interfering with your benefits. This life insurance exemption is kind of um, laughable in that life insurance Medicaid allows you to keep, can't have a face value greater than $1,500. So let's say, I mean, that obviously is intended more to cover burial expenses. So um, if you have a term life insurance policy, the death benefit can be unlimited because a term policy has zero cash value. But if you bought a life insurance policy as an investment, vehicle and it's worth 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, whatever it may be, that is a countable resource. Sales contracts, if you have certain sales contracts, they will not be countable. Uh, there's something called a long-term care partnership insurance policy. And if you have something like that, I believe all the policies sold now in the state of Washington would comply with this requirement. Let's say you have a, um, such a, a policy and it pays a benefit for your long-term care of $100,000, then you'll be allowed to keep an extra $100,000 because you bought a policy that will provide for your care up to 100,000. Uh, another exception to what counts is if you cannot convert an asset in 20 days to cash, it is disregarded and it is not counted. That provides a lot of planning opportunities uh, for a couple in particular, but also for a single person. And then one of the biggest tools that we use as uh, Medicaid planning attorneys is an annuity. Now, it's a Medicaid compliant annuity. So, if you have a typical annuity that your financial planner advised and you thought was a great idea, that annuity counts. So an annuity that doesn't count is one that uh, complies with Washington's strict requirements, which includes that upon your death or the death upon your death, that it will pay back to the state for benefits that were paid on behalf of your spouse. So if you're listening, unless you have, are working with an elder law attorney and know you have a Medicaid compliant annuity, 
your annuity is not Medicaid compliant and it counts as a resource. So those are the things that don't count um, as a, against you. So what does count? Well, basically everything else, your investment accounts, your second car, your lake cabin, your um, IRA, your 401k. Keep in mind what I said earlier, I'm talking about the state of Washington's rules. Other states don't count your IRA, don't count your 401k. So wherever you are, residing wherever you will be getting care you need to talk to the elder law attorney where you live because your rules may be quite a bit different than washington's rules especially because these retirement accounts often are uh, one of the biggest assets in somebody's estate so um, sometimes you know if you are in a an area like we're in spokane for example you know, Coeur d'Alene Post Falls is not very far. That's Idaho's rules. Sometimes it's advantageous for the client to um, become eligible for Medicaid in that state because their rules will be different. And then the care delivered at Post Falls won't be different than the care delivered in Spokane Valley. So just keep that in mind if you are in one of those uh, states where it's possible or one of those areas where uh, you're close to a different state it may be advantageous to look at qualifying for medicaid in the different state because for example they won't count your ira or your 401k so i'm not expecting you to remember all this but what i do hope you remember is seeing a, an elder law attorney where you live so that's what counts in a moment we're going to talk about well what can you give away without a problem and what can't you give away? Because we're trying to follow the theme of no spend down, keep all your assets. So what are Medicaid standards currently? So what they are right now, if you are a single person for the stuff that counts and Medicaid has not changed this rule since 1989, you can keep $2,000. So indeed, if you are a single person, for your countable assets, Medicaid is an impoverishment program. We're going to talk about strategies and exceptions and things you can do, but I don't want to mislead you. Medicaid for a single person is an impoverishment program. Let's say you are not single, but you are a couple. Then is Medicaid an impoverishment program? I would say no, it is not. There is what's called a community spousal resource allowance so that your countable resources can range basically between $70,000 and $150,000. So that might not be all of your estate. Certainly you might have countable resources of 500,000. We're gonna talk about how you can keep all of them, but the basic standard in the state of Washington for what a couple can keep the 2000 for the ill spouse and then the community spousal resource allowances and that gets the couple what they can keep countable resources basically 70,000 to a hundred and fifty thousand dollars what we're going to talk about next is what does medicaid allow you to give away no penalty no problem maybe you are a single person so some of the tools that are available for couples that we're going to be talking about aren't available to you so you really can't keep all your assets but maybe you want to give your assets to your child um, or to your children what can you do what does medicaid allow you to do with no penalty. So we're going to go over the rules regarding exceptions to the transfer penalty. Medicaid says general rule that if you give away any asset within 60 months of applying for Medicaid, if you gave away an asset, Medicaid's going to apply a penalty period. Currently what that penalty period is for us in Washington is for every $11,076 you gave away, there's a one month penalty period. So if you give away 10 times that, there's a 10 month 
penalty period. There are uh, strategies we use to intentionally invoke the penalty period. That is not something that anyone should try on their own because it is pretty complicated. So general rule, you don't give away assets within five years of applying for Medicaid. But what if some of these exceptions apply to you? For example, there's an exception that's called the caregiver child transfer exception. Basically what that means is if your child lived with you in your home and provided care for to you for two years before you needed to apply for Medicaid, then and if the doctor's statement will uh, verify that you needed such care and you comply with all of Medicaid's um, very specific rules, you can give your ch uh, child your home no penalty. So that is a big opportunity for people, single people. Nobody wants to move out of their home. So they try to stay in their home. The family tries to support them. The caregiver child is providing care. Sometimes that will go throughout your entire life. And sometimes it gets too much. It's too demanding. And you'll need to perhaps move from your home to either a skilled nursing or an adult family home or something like that. There's a lot of traps on this one for actually giving away the home in that there can't be a private pay period ever between the caregiving at the home and you applying for Medicaid. So that's something that if you're thinking of, please see your elder law attorney to make sure that you get that right. Because not getting it right means you don't get to take advantage of giving your home to your child, no penalty. There's another exemption that you can give your home to your sibling if you and your sibling have lived together for a year and your sibling has an equity interest in the home. No caregiving involved, just equity, sibling with equity interest. So that's another great opportunity. Um, you can give your home to your child if they're under the age of 21. You can give your home to your disabled child. Now, when I say disabled child, you might be thinking of a special needs child, which perhaps it is. And so that's a whole nother layer of complexity and planning. But your disabled child could be your 50 year old son who had a back injury from a physically demanding job. That's a disabled child and you can give your home to that person. There are other exceptions. You can give away all your assets to a trust, either for your disabled child or to a disabled person. Perhaps there's somebody who's not related to you and they're disabled and you they would be your beneficiary of your estate. You can give all your assets to the trust for this person without having Medicaid impose a penalty on you and if it's done correctly, that trust also won't interfere with that person's receipt of any needs-based government benefits that they get. So two layers of complications there. Definitely your elder law attorney will help you with that possibility. Otherwise, in terms of what is written in the code as to you know, what you can give away, um, I've covered them all at least as they apply in Washington. So sometimes those clients do have disabled uh, people in their life, disabled child, caregiver child exemption, uh, sibling with an equity interest. We're able to, if not allow that single person to keep the asset, it goes where they want it to go. The state doesn't get it and Medicaid will cover all long-term care costs. All of these rules also apply to a couple. Typically, however, with a couple, we're using other strategies, but keep in mind that they do also exist and potentially supplement the other strategies that a couple has that I'll be talking about. Before we move on from single people and what can they do, I wanted you to be aware that there are some programs currently in existence where there is no resource standard, not the 2000 that I told you about. If you are under the age of 65 and you are not receiving Medicare benefits and you need skilled nursing care, there's no resource limit. Medicaid will pay. This is under what's called the MAGI program. So there are 
very um, unique situations where you don't have to worry about resources. Keep in mind, when you age out to 65, you're going to have to comply with all of the resource rules. If that's five years in advance of you turning 65, then the five-year look-back policy doesn't uh, period doesn't apply to you. So you can actually give those assets to a family trust of which you are not a beneficiary, but your family is. Um, and of which you don't have control. So you can preserve those assets, if not keep them for yourself. So there are some um, avenues for a single person to make sure that they preserve what they've worked so hard for during their lifetime. So let's shift and let's talk about married persons. I already said that a married person can keep 70 to 150,000 in countable assets plus their house. Let's say that um, they also have a lake cabin and they didn't plan five years in advance. They didn't put it in an irrevocable trust five years in advance, they didn't give it away. So they have that, that's gonna be a countable resource except for remember, I said that if it can't sell within 20 days, it's disregarded. So that lake cabin, won't sell within 20 days likely and it won't interfere with benefits so that's a planning opportunity to keep in mind frankly when we're meeting with clients and we ask them do you have legacy property and they say yes and we're looking at trying to get that out of the couple's ownership sooner than later if it's that if it's appropriate if it's not going to be one of those cabins that's going to be sold it's going to be kept in the family what else can we do for a couple let me explain through um, an example and uh, we will if you signed up for the webinar um, we will be providing you a couple of handouts that's going to be really helpful uh, for example one of them is how couples can protect their assets from long-term care costs and this is talking about a couple who has more than what the Medicaid standard is and they wanna keep all their assets. How are they gonna do that? So example, let's take uh, a couple, let's say that they are Mark and Mary and what is going on with them is that they have assets, they own their home, remember? that's not countable their home can be worth 300,000 it could be worth 500 it could be worth a million it doesn't matter it's irrelevant what is relevant is what do they have that's countable and in our situation they are going to have countable resources let's say 150,000 Roth IRA 100,000 403B 50,000 in the checking account a 200,000 stock portfolio. If you're with me adding those up, that comes to $500,000. $500,000 is more than what Medicaid says you can keep, but they still are meeting with an elder law attorney who's going to help them keep all their assets. In this situation with Mark and Mary, let's say what's happened is Mark has collapsed. He's had a stroke. He's partially paralyzed. He's gone through rehab. He's getting better, but you know what? He is a, a bigger guy, Mary's a smaller gal, Mary's 80 years old. She is not going to be able to take care of her husband at their home without probably her falling ill. One of the things that I always like to keep in mind when I'm talking to people about long-term care is the caregiver's spouse is often the one who fails first. We really wanna make sure that the caregiver spouse doesn't sacrifice their life. Um, sometimes they think that that's all and they have to do that. But we want to make sure you're aware that this couple is going to qualify for Medicaid and the safest and best place for Mark, sadly, is going to be in that skilled nursing facility. And that's going to run 12 to 14,000 a month. And yeah, the couple can afford it for a little while for a year or more, but you know what? It is going to completely eat into their savings such that when Mark passes, Mary's not going to have enough money to keep up her house or to, to have the quality of life that the couple had envisioned for themselves. So fortunately, Mark and Mary come to the elder law attorneys. Fortunately, 
We've already done their estate planning such that even if Mark has lost capacity, he has the right durable power of attorney in place that Mary can do this Medicaid planning because she has the authority to do it and her estate plan was prepared and their estate plan was prepared by elder law attorneys with Medicaid expertise. What are we going to do? As I mentioned, the house doesn't count. Great. They have one car. Let's say that their car is an old car and they need a better one. Then they sell the old car and then they get a newer car and they use some of their excess money to do so. Let's say that they don't need to spend down any money on anything. Their house is in great shape, doesn't need a roof or plumbing or anything. Their car is brand new, no debt, everything is paid off. Mark is looking at going to the skilled nursing facility. How are we going to get this couple uh, qualified for Medicaid, have Medicaid pay for Mark's care, and allow them to keep their $500,000 in countable assets. Well, we know that they can keep 150. That's easy. What are we going to do with the other $350,000? Most people will spend it down. And candidly, attorneys that don't do Medicaid planning might give that same advice. Fortunately, Mark and Mary are working with a Medicaid expert, Medicaid attorney with expertise. And we are going to give them guidance to take that extra $350,000. We're going to move it all over into the name of the well spouse, Mary. She is going to buy a Medicaid compliant annuity. What that means is that's the annuity that the state of Washington allows that will pay back to Mary over 60 months. Every month for 60 months, she will get uh, a payment. So if it was 360,000, she's going to get $5,833 back every month. That money's coming back to her. That money does not go to pay for Mark's care in the care facility. Only his income does. And what his income doesn't cover for his care costs, the state of Washington through the Medicaid program covers the rest. Mary gets to keep her house. She gets to keep the car. She gets to keep the 150,000. And she gets to keep all of that money that comes back month by month by month by month back to her and does not need to contribute any of that to Mark's care. This is the state of Washington's rules. If you're listening from a different state, as a reminder, your rules can be completely different than what I just described. But for the state of Washington, if you are a resident and you are a couple and you have a house worth a million, you have 500,000 in countable assets and one of you needs heavy duty, high cost, long-term care, an annuity often is, a Medicaid compliant annuity often is the best plan that we uh, will recommend for our clients because they get to keep all their assets and get Medicaid, no spend down. We simply converted what was a countable asset to a non-countable asset. That's what I want you to, to understand such that if you are ever in that situation, you will see an elder law attorney and not feel like you have to spend down all your money because with the Medicaid compliant annuity option, you don't need to do so. So that's what I meant when I say couples have great planning options. Now you might be saying, well, what's the catch? Why would the uh, Medicaid allow this annuity? What's the catch? Here's the catch. If Mary doesn't survive that 60 month term of the annuity, then on her death, she's no longer able to get that $5,833. Who gets it? The payment is now going to go to the state of Washington month after month. Sometimes annuities pay out in a lump sum when Mary has died. And how much is going to go to the state of Washington? That is determined by what has the state paid on Mark's behalf for his long-term care benefits measured as of the date of Mary's death. That's what the state gets. 
So once the state is paid back, if there's anything left in that um, annuity, then it can go to whoever the beneficiaries of Mary's estate would have been. So that's how we qualify a couple for Medicaid and keep all of their assets. Now you might be saying, well, doesn't the state get anything? Again, if Medicaid dies during the term of the Medicaid compliant annuity, yes, they do. If Medicaid, if Mary survives the term, then the state's gonna get nothing. They're not gonna get the couple's house. Why not? Because we did a quick claim deed where we transferred the interest of the ill spouse, Mark, to Mary. So she owns the house completely. If Mark was incapacitated, how did we do it? We did it through a durable power of attorney that allowed us to do that on Mary's behalf. That's why your durable powers of attorney are so important. How about all the other assets? Bank account, only in the well spouse's name. We put all of the assets into the name of the well spouse. And that way, when the ill spouse dies, there is nothing for the state to collect upon. That's Washington's rules. I know Idaho's rules are different. Wherever you're listening from, your state's rules may be very different as well. You might be saying, well, what if Mary dies before Mark? She's got all of the house and all of this money. What, what's going to happen? Isn't Mark going to be kicked off of Medicaid when she dies before him and all the assets go through her will to him? And the answer would be yes, if they didn't do the right planning. The right planning is that Mary's will, and it must be a will, it cannot be a revocable living trust, it must be a will. Mary's will contains what's called an asset protection supplemental needs trust for the benefit of her husband. So if she dies before her husband, all of the assets, remember she's got everything in her name, passes to this trust for his benefit, the house, and then the bank account. So he is not kicked off of Medicaid. The money in that trust is there to help supplement his care, but it doesn't interfere or it doesn't have to be contributed to his long-term care costs. And then when he has a past, then usually that trust money will go wherever the couple wanted it to go, to their kids or wherever they wanted the money to go. So couples, you have excellent planning options. Every situation is different. I took a very simple situation. We commonly work with clients who are looking at care at home or care at an assisted living or memory care. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important for you to realize is that those um, facilities that are not skilled nursing, they often have what's called a private pay period. So even though we might be able to do a great Medicaid plan, just like I described, the facility won't take Medicaid for two years or three years. Part of doing your estate planning, part of thinking about Medicaid planning, long-term care planning, is working with an elder law attorney who understands how to all these pieces of this puzzle get put together to make sure that you and your loved one get the best care possible while keeping as much money as you can and using Medicaid benefits when the facility will allow you to use them. Talk about single people. So I'm gonna pivot a little bit and we're gonna talk about single people because oftentimes they go, gosh, that is great for a married couple, but I am single. So we're gonna talk about single people. Oh, by the way, before I talk too much about single people, sometimes couples say, well, shouldn't we get divorced? And, uh, you know, if a couple's been married 50 years and they haven't yet divorced, sometimes it doesn't sit well with them to be divorced. And frankly, in our practice and um, for ELG estate planning, uh, we've been in business for 17 years. We've never done a couple's divorce for Medicaid planning. There's just too many other good tools available that it's never been something that made any sense. So before you get divorced, if you're a couple, maybe you'll um, want to check with a, a, an elder law attorney that you have a great deal of confidence in that that's the right route for you. Okay, let's talk about a single person. Usually single people and they're facing long-term care costs, they go, I don't have enough money to pay this 8,000 or 10,000 or 12,000 or whatever it's going to be. I'm going to run out of money. I better sell my house. And oftentimes they sell their house. And what do they do? They spend all their money till they've spent everything, everything they have. And then they apply for Medicaid. 
I can tell you that is the wrong strategy. Please do not do that. Please see an elder law attorney who can help you. Let me give you an example. Your home is an exempt resource. If you've got over a million dollars of equity in it, then there'll have to be more strategies. But let's say your home is worth less than a million dollars, okay? And you're gonna go into a care facility and you don't want everything you've worked for to go to your care costs. What are you gonna do? Well, it really depends on what your situation is, but let's talk about somebody who maybe they've been at the adult family home for two years and they've spent money over the course of the last two years and the facility will now take Medicaid. We're gonna take a look at how much money there is and then we're gonna make sure that they've bought everything that they can buy that makes sense. Um, sometimes it might mean that they've got only $50,000 left and you might recommend buy a $50,000 $50, car. You might go, that's crazy, why would you do that? Because once the person's on Medicaid, the car, which is an exempt resource, can be transferred actually with no penalty. So that might be a way to go. It depends on the situation. But in this situation, let's say we have someone we'll call her Darlene. She's in an adult family home and her house is modest. It's worth 250,000. And what she has done is she has privately paid for the two years. So she's now saying I'm eligible for Medicaid, but I have my house. Should I just sell my house and reap the 250,000 from the sale proceeds? We would tell her, no, there's a better option than that. Because Medicaid doesn't count the house as an accountable asset, she applies for Medicaid. Medicaid benefits are awarded. Medicaid benefits uh, cover what her income does not. She's allowed to keep a $100 personal needs allowance, not much. And frankly, that's kind of hard to keep her house going because of all the expenses related to the house. So what is she going to do? Oh, and plus, if she keeps the house in her name, we don't have a spouse to transfer it to, so the state is going to end up with her house, at least have a lien on it to cover what benefits they paid on her behalf, unless there's some other exception that applies. But in this case, we're going to sell the house after she's on Medicaid. Really important, after, not before. And in this case, she can gift probably close to 75% of that house proceeds. Let's say it sells for 250, she can gift $190,000 to a family trust for the benefit of her children. Keep in mind, she can't be a beneficiary. So she makes the gift, she keeps 60,000. The reason that we she's allowed to keep the money is that she's already on Medicaid. She's not an applicant, she's a recipient. She keeps the money, Medicaid says, oh, you now, have 60,000 and you gave away 190,000. So you're off of Medicaid. And that was our plan. So she's off of Medicaid for a period of time. Currently, as I said, Medicaid um, penalty period is $11,000, some odd sense. So she's off of Medicaid for about 17 months. What does she do during that 17 months? She uses her income and the money she retained for the, the sale of her home that she didn't gift, and she pays for her uh, adult family home for the next 17 months. She applies again and she's back on Medicaid. What was the result of this? Out of the $250,000, her asset, her home, she was able to preserve and protect $190,000. As opposed to spending it all down, as opposed to keeping it and uh, letting the state get it when she's gone. So that's another handout we have, uh, and it's talking about strategies for a single person, just a very simple one, but just to help you understand that if the question that you have as a single person is, should I sell my house to pay my nursing home bill or my adult family home bill? The answer might be no, you should not, because we have strategies that will work for you. So, um, okay, well, the lights are going out here. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them for you. So 
Let's take a look. Okay. Question. What about cash gifts to children and grandchildren? Yeah. A, any kind of gift, cash gift is going to be considered a disqualifying gift as a general rule for Medicaid eligibility. So it, frankly, it really depends on what the gift is. I mean, are you talking about um, a high school graduation present? That's going to be okay. Birthday gifts, Christmas gifts, that's going to be okay. If you're talking about I gifted to my grandchild 10,000 to help them with their college, that's not going to be okay. Any gift that you make is presumed to be for purposes of qualifying for Medicaid and you must prove that it wasn't, not just by a reasonable standard, but by clear, cogent, convincing evidence. So it's a high standard. Tithing. If you've been given regular tithing to your church or other charity for years and years and years and years, that's not going to be a problem. However, Qualifying for Medicaid, we might likely recommend that you stop that because we're doing a Medicaid application, that the past tithing should not be a problem. If you have a mortgage on your house, then one of the smartest things that you can do when we're qualifying you for Medicaid is pay off that mortgage. Let's say if you recall back to that example of the couple that had their home, let's say, and they had 500,000, Let's say that rather than buying the Medicaid annuity with the 350,000 too much, they had a 350,000 mortgage, pay it off. You don't need an annuity then. Then you have a house that's worth more. And if you want to draw money from that, draw it from a home equity line of credit or something like that. Can money in a 401k of the institutionalized spouse be moved into the name of a well spouse or used to get a Medicaid compliant annuity without paying a large tax penalty? This is an excellent question. And it's one we run into troubles with all of the time. The general answer is no. You're gonna to have to liquidate that and move it over to um, a bank account and then that, and pay taxes, accelerate the income tax liability, and then move it over to the well spouse who's gonna buy a Medicaid compliant annuity. Now, what I am, um, that answer is gonna be different depending on what state you are in. And, uh, but just as a general rule, no, uh, institutionalized spouses, 401k can be problematic. I can tell you that I have colleagues who will go to court and get um, a quadro, a qualified domestic relationship order to try to accomplish that move without paying taxes. So I'm saying, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm saying that um, I have seen attorneys do that in the state of Washington, though I know it is seldom done, but don't rule it out. Typically, um, we don't go that route here, um, not to say that it can't be done. Is there an amount limit for for Christmas or birthday gifts or graduation gifts, it's reasonableness standard. And what's reasonable, really, what's reasonable really depends on um, maybe your past history. Let's say you always gave $500 to each kid versus, you know, $50. If you always gave $5,000, that's going to be problematic. Um, right now, currently, Medicaid says that every month, if you are on Medicaid, you can give away $367 each month, even if you're on Medicaid and they don't disqualify you. So certainly anything in that amount is not gonna be problematic, I wouldn't think. Um, but again, when you're applying for Medicaid, you're dealing with the state agency and um, Home and Community Services of DSHS. And they have some really great, well-meaning, qualified people who are absolutely doing their best to process their application. It is not adversarial, but they have a duty to make sure that they find all the assets and, um, you know, they're looking for anything that might mean you're not eligible for, for Medicaid. So, um, what, I, and, and 
the personnel who are there change over the years. Sometimes you get more qualified people, sometimes less qualified. Our job as, as the attorney is to help make sure that the Medicaid application goes through as smoothly as possible. That's not to say that sometimes they don't ask for five years of bank records or of this or of that, which they have a right to do. And it's incredibly onerous and expensive. So um, I guess what I would say is we have a lot of great strategies for Medicaid. The actual Medicaid application process can be extremely onerous. So bring your patients and it can be quite expensive uh, to do so when you're working with the attorney. All right, we are, I don't see any more questions. Let me double check here. So that pretty much covers what I wanted to cover today. Um, when we're talking about Medicaid, there's all sorts of, uh, we could spend a lot of time. I didn't cover, for example, the Community First Choice Program here in Washington, the CFC program. That program has no transfer penalty if your income is below a certain standard. And sometimes that is used as a part of a Medicaid strategy for a single person um, because they can give away their assets with no penalty. Everybody's situation is different. You are not gonna get the answer if you call over the phone, hey, what's my Medi Medicaid strategy? It is very detailed. It relies on your situation, your finances, your family dynamics, your um, care needs, and what that is gonna look like over the next year and years. So your attorney is somebody you are going to be working with. So find an attorney you're comfortable with, somebody who is very knowledgeable in this area. All right. If you have any more questions, you can reach out to us at our website, elgwa.com. Um, again, we'll be sending out to those who are um, part of the webinar today uh, some more materials. You can always call us. We're at 509-468-0551 or you can email us at info at elgwa.com. If you found this uh, helpful, and if you're watching it on YouTube where we put these videos after the webinar, please give us a thumbs up, a like, subscribe, share this information. I can't tell you how many times people have said, oh, I know of somebody, my neighbor, um, someone else who, you know, they didn't realize it and they spent down all of their money. And really our goal is to provide this educational content so that people have a better understanding and can take um, better action to protect themselves and their family and their money and get the best care possible. Thanks again, appreciate it.